So they're all starting the nucleus with the transcription of the DNA code into an RNA code with the help of, of RNA polymerase and a lot of different proteins which act as transcription factors. And then this RNA, if it's in your eukaryotes, is going to be processed in a, and it's going to be adding a poly A tail, a G cap, and the removal of the introns to make an exon only mature RNA. That's going to be happening with the help of spliceosomes and ligase. Then the, it leaves to the nuclear pores and immediately goes into the, to the cytoplasm where enzymes are looking to destroy it. But if they don't get destroyed, a ribosome will attach themselves to it using the energy of the G cap and a lot of initiation factors and help connect the smaller ribosomal unit and the large ribosomal unit and the first transfer RNA carrying methionone to initiate the trans translation process. As the ribosome will travel through the messenger RNA through elongation and transfer RNAs will move from, a, from P site to E site and from A site to P site as the, the Another set of enzymes called elongation factors help these attachments take place. And an enzyme called peptidyl transferase will actually help the polypeptide chain elongate over time. Remember, all of this will be controlled by the pairing of a codon with an anticodon with the help of elongation factors. And the transfer RNA is going to be carrying the proper amino acid. And it's carrying the proper amino acid because amino acid tRNA synthetase made sure that it was paired up correctly. And remember, those amino acids come from digestive processes that happen inside the cell. A after the time in when we reach the actual anticodon that sends the message to stop, this will also all end as the ribosome will, leach, will be receive the message of a release factor to release this and actually complete the protein synthesis process and all the pieces will separate and the protein is done. And you can do this sequentially in an assembly line format in something that's called a polyribosome. From that point, a signal sequence on the N-terminus side of the protein will actually indicate whether this protein is destined to be used inside or outside the cell. And a special molecule called a signal recognition particle, which is made of proteins and yet another type of RNA called SRP RNA, will actually recognize this signal sequence and, and guide the ribosome with the protein being built towards the rough ER. And then there, a SRP receptor will allow it the SRP to connect to it, allowing the ribosome to attach itself to the surface of the rough ER, and from that point on, the protein will be made into a pore, allowing the protein to be trapped inside the lumen of the rough ER, where it will be changed and then sent into the Golgi apparatus for packaging and exportation from the outside of the cell. This will happen, of course, if the signal sequence indicated that that was the destination that it had to be gone to. If it was destined to go inside of another organelle or even the nucleus, a different path will be taken altogether. Chemical and physical changes to the protein may also take place before the protein is completed. Sometimes chaperone proteins help the protein fold into the tertiary and quaternary structures that they must assume before they can actually become functional. Other things that can happen are that proteins can be clipped and removed domains which are necessary. They can also split into smaller chunks which then become functional or they might join other subunits to form a larger protein which has multiple functions. You can also add chemicals and functional groups and other parts of macromolecules to change the structure of the protein for a designated destination or function. And if the protein is incorrectly conformed or folded, it may need to be refolded or destroyed. And that's gene expression. And at any point during this entire process that I described, you could have a defect that leads to a malformation of the protein. And it also, at any one of these points, can serve as a roadblock at which the cell can stop gene expression if it needs to do so. And that we're going to talk about when we do gene expression control later. But one thing that's actually very interesting is that prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells do this very differently. The RNA polymerase types are going to be different. Transcription speed is going to be a lot faster in prokaryotes, which will not also not do any kind of RNA processing since they don't have introns. The structure of the gene of, of prokaryotes is also completely different, and it may not have the transcription units which are as complex as eukaryotic cells are, as well as the regulation control is completely different. Transcription factors involved will not be similar either, neither will be the termination signals to allow the RNA polymerase to disconnect. Ribosomes are made of a different kind of ribosomal RNA, which will actually lead to a dif differential classification of prokaryotes into two large groups, one archaea, one eubacteria. And they are definitely different from the other eukaryotes in that sense. 
and we're actually closer to archaea than to eubacteria, which is interesting. And we'll talk about that when we do the taxonomy lecture. And the initiation factors will also be different since the ribosome structures are different, and translational speed will be a lot faster in prokaryotes, almost as if they're not worried about mutations. Almost as if mutations is what they want, since they don't have sexual reproduction to create a variety. The elongation factors and release factors will also be different among prokaryotes, and regulation of MRA production into proteins is going to be completely different, since all of these differences will exist, and therefore the roadblocks will also be different. Also, prokaryotes won't do the same kinds of post-translational processing that eukaryotes do. For example, they don't have the rough ER or the Golgi to help package the protein for export outside of the cell. Which means if you try to make a protein that's a human-made protein inside of a bacteria, it will not turn out exactly the same as it would in a eukaryote because it lacks the procedures to actually do post-translational post processing that eukaryotic cells actually have. But regardless of whether you're doing this in a prokaryotic or eukaryotic cell, one thing is for certain. Lots of proteins and RNA are going to be necessary to make this process successful. And one thing, it, and if anything, one thing that we've learned is that RNA can have multiple different types and jobs. We talked about the main mRNA, tRNA, and rRNA groups extensively, but we also talked about snRNA or small nuclear RNA, which are part of the SNRPs, which make part of the spliceosomes and are involved in RNA processing. We also talk about SRP RNA, which are part of the SRP particles which guide proteins to the rough ER if they're necessary to be exported from the cell. We also mention ribozymes, which are RNA pieces which are free on the cytoplasm and act like enzymes in a series of chemical reactions that sometimes have nothing to do with protein synthesis. That's RNA acting like an enzyme. You also have small interfering RNA, mRNA and piRNA, which are different kinds of RNA which regulate gene expression among eukaryotes as well as have connections with viral genome protections and things like that. Speaking of that, some viral genomes are made of RNA, including viroids, which are nothing more than self-replicating RNAs with no other structure at all. And so, as you can see, RNA can have a lot of roles. It can be an information carrier, a structural component, a catalytic component, a director, a recognition molecule, or even a regulatory molecule. And that suggests that RNA may have been the first original molecule of life. Early on in the evolutionary process, it would be hard to understand how a protein can perform by chance if all of this is necessary just to make a simple protein. The chances of a simple protein assembly by chance are astronomically small if you actually do the math, since there's a 1 in 20 chance for every single amino acid in the sequence to be in that particular place. Any protein beyond 20 will have more numbers in the probability calculation than seconds in the history of the universe. So chances are that even with enough trials, that's not going to happen by chance alone. And DNA is way more complex than RNA, having double helixes and all the genes connected to it. So more likely than not, RNA evolved first, and then DNA evolved from RNA, but RNA that curved upon itself or that doubled, and then connected to other RNAs like it to form a longer multi-gene structure that we now recognize as DNA. And RNA can actually suffice the role of DNA and proteins in so, uh, to some extent, and so the first life forms may have been based on RNA. But one thing is for sure, it's hard to answer that question because you see, you need DNA to have the RNA nowadays, and you need the RNA in order to have proteins. But you need proteins in order to duplicate DNA and to make RNA, and you're also going to need RNA to make DNA since you need the proteins which may come from the RNA. It's, it's so you have the chicken and the egg situation where everything seems to be part of each other. But if you had to hypothesize about the very first one, you probably should go with RNA because of all the large amount of evidence pointing to the fact that RNA has multiple roles and that it is a simpler structure from which DNA could have evolved or proteins could have been made from. Now, what this whole machinery did not evolve from nowhere. It evolved slowly but surely, and by now we have a much more complex mechanism. And the proof that you don't need a complex mechanism is the prokaryotic protein synthesis, which is much simpler than this. And in fact, Viruses don't even have a mechanism. They borrow one when they invade their host cells. And, and, and viroids, which are just RNA, can self-replicate and not even need a, a cell machinery at some times. So that, that just comes to indicate that life is a lot more complicated than we think. But one thing is for sure, protein synthesis gene expression is at the core of everything that makes us who we are. And the DNA codes for RNA, which then codes for protein. And that my friends, is protein synthesis. And I hope you learn a lot and go out there and don't do anything that would make a mama proud.